So we're looking at the book of Romans. We started uh, speaking in Romans, it feels like ages ago now that I did the first talk on Romans because we've had different things happening in between. But we looked at the fact that Paul used this word euangelion, which means almost too good to be true news. And how it was actually offensive to the, the, to the uh, authorities in Rome because that phrase was only actually used by the Caesars and the emperors about their authority and, and, and their kingship and lordship. And Paul was actually challenging their kingship and authority, saying actually Jesus is the real king. And so I was thinking of that as, as he said, you know, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Paul could have easily backed off and put some more comfortable words <laughs> than saying that. He went in with a with, thrown a hand grenade in to, to this place, effectively going over and set a, a whole chain of events off in, in this church. And in this letter that he's written to the Christians in Rome. Is, is, is one of the highlights. It's, it's, it's absolutely an amazing book. It's the best book in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> and then you look at it and oh no, this is the best book in the Bible. And we studied Ephesians, which was also written by Paul. And we talked about how that, in its own right, is held up as one of the most, uh, the best written pieces of literature, not just in scripture, but in the world. You know, for its literary content as well as its theological <laughs> content. And, and then Paul writes this letter to the Christians in Rome, which is just absolutely packed with theological uh, truths. You know, it, it, it is crammed with it. You know, and a, a lot of theologians, a lot of writers would, would hold up Hebrews and Romans as probably two of the pinnacle books in the New Testament of, 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 of outlining theology and, and they appeal to us don't they as western people who, who like to be technical who like to have information and facts and we, we feed on that sort of thing don't we you know and I, I actually when we pack romans there is so much information in there we were we were up at david lynn's a couple of weeks ago they invited us up for a meal that's me and Anne, because uh, they've been given a bottle of champagne and it went nice of them to invite us to come and share their bottle of champagne and so dave's in the kitchen with this bottle of champagne, trying to take the top off carefully because his only order is not to damage the ceiling. <laughs> but he fails in taking it off carefully, but succeeds in not damaging the ceiling. Bang! <laughs> As a bottle of champagne does. And I think Romans is a bit like that. Actually, really, there's just all this truth just bursting to come out of this book of Romans and all this information and all this knowledge and all this truth about grace and, and, and redemption and, you know, and the cross and sanctification. And, and we could just marvel, really, at the information that is in it. But as I read, particularly, this passage that Ruth has just read for us and thought on it, I thought, actually, is that really the point of Romans? Do we actually, if, if we, we need to just make sure we get a point of reference to start with. Because is, is Romans just a theological essay? Is it just a treatise on some principles and some facts? Or is it more personal than that? Is it about theology? Or is it about the person? And is that person really Jesus Christ? Because read, when, when, when we read this again at the end, you'll see Paul says his gospel is the gospel of Jesus Christ and it's a deeply personal letter about how his life is centred around Jesus and how all the principles and the theologies and everything else follows from that. It's not the other way around. It's not that he has this theology and he points to Jesus. Actually Jesus has drawn him into this. Does that make sense? Because I wonder sometimes, I think I have to think myself, when I'm explaining the office as I'm not ashamed of the gospel, what gospel am I preaching? What gospel am I speaking? Am I speaking a gospel that is about rules or about principles and about facts? And am I drawing people to, to some sort of lifestyle or some um, way of living, which in a sense you are, but are you actually first drawing them to Jesus? Is your gospel centered around Jesus or around theology? Because it's 
kind of like a chicken and egg, isn't it? Which way round is it? It should be Jesus, which then demands a response. Not a whole load of principles that if we keep them, perhaps we'll meet Jesus. Because there's so many people who think that, that that is what will happen. And I think that is a danger as we study Romans, that we just pick up a whole load of information and a whole load of knowledge and, and, and feel very pleased with ourselves that we now know the definition of a Greek word that we didn't know before or, or something of that ilk. But actually what Paul wants them to know is the character and the nature of Jesus Christ. And this is because he says it is the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's son, born of David, crucified and risen again. That's what he points out in Romans chapter 1. And this is the truth of Paul's Gospels actually in all the letters that he writes. When he writes to Timothy, he writes to Timothy and he says, you know, this is the Gospel that I am imprisoned for. The Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of the lineage of David, risen and the Saviour of the world. This is the Gospel that I preach. And um, imprisoned for. It needs, as <laughs> what we're talking about here, as, as every good Sunday school teacher knows, it all has to be, what's the topic? Well, it's all about Jesus. <laughs> yeah? And, 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 and that might sound sweet, but actually, that is the truth of what we need to be preaching. And I was thinking of it also in the context of um, when the Holy Spirit came. Isn't it marvellous that Peter preached the first really uh, lengthy, outright sermon there in Jerusalem after the Holy Spirit came, because he was the one that denied God beforehand. I know that the Holy Spirit, there's this story of how the Holy Spirit comes and restores him, and suddenly you restore my soul. And, you know, he was restored by the Holy Spirit. So this man who once was saying, no, I don't know Jesus, has never seen him before in your life, but I don't know what you're talking about, and says it three times, is now standing in front of thousands of people and he says you men of Jerusalem and the, and the Romans were there as well he says you need to know that this is the day that the prophet Joel spoke of when he said I will pour out my spirit on all flesh on all men on all women and some of them will dream dreams some of them will have visions and some of them you know will you will all prophesy he says he says, and what is this all about? He says it is because Jesus is the Son of God and he, was, he came to earth and he was attested by miracles and by signs and wonders, but it was you who crucified him, but it was God who raised him from the dead. He made it very personal and his whole first sermon was actually saying it's all about Jesus. Paul says, my gospel is all about Jesus. I think actually it was Peter as well, wasn't it? In Acts chapter 10, when he goes to the house of Cornelius, and Cornelius says to him, you just tell us whatever God's got on your heart to tell us. So it's like those preaching in church, and they don't give you a theme. They just say, you know, you, 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 know, you preach what you think is appropriate. And Cornelius says, you preach whatever God has given you, given you to tell us. And I think Peter spends about the next 10 verses basically giving Jesus his CV. He says he's a man from Galilee who was baptised by John, anointed by the Holy Spirit, and attested by miracles, by signs and wonders. He went about doing good. And what did you do? You crucified him. But God raised <coughs> him from the dead. And it says, as he talked about that, the Holy Spirit came down, and then they took <coughs> the first Gentiles to be converted. And that caused a bit of upset to him, and what to do with them. <laughs> but he spoke about Jesus, he made the centre, of every talk he gave, the centre of it was Jesus. And Jesus right at the heart, and Romans is the same, uh, Hebrews is the same as Romans, it's Jesus at the centre. We mustn't start a study of them with the intent of just picking up more and more knowledge. We need to read them with the sense that we are coming. Son of God, the Holy One, the Alpha and Omega, the One who was there at the creation of the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. So we need to see that we have a personal Saviour, a personal God, a personal God who cares about us. 
and be intimately involved with us. And this is what Paul is reminding the Romans right at the outset of his letter, that this is a deeply personal gospel about the work that Jesus has done. And we sang that I'm no longer a slave to fear. Now Paul strikes me as an extraordinary man who wasn't particularly fearful of people. But he certainly sets out his soul right at the beginning of this letter, like we talked about using the word euangelion and saying Jesus is the real king. I'm not really that fussed about you as a Caesar or an emperor. I'm more concerned with Jesus. And he talks about how he is a bond slave to Jesus. And I think there is an interest, and this is my second point really, is how do we respond to this gospel? What gospel exactly is Paul preaching? Paul is preaching a gospel that demands a response to what Jesus has done. You know, it's very easy to preach a gospel of how much God loves you, how much God cares for you, how he loves you so much that he gave his only son to die on the cross for you, that he doesn't want you to go to hell, he wants you to spend eternity with him. And that's true. That is true. It says in John 3.16, doesn't it? God so loved the world, he gave his only son, who so that believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. But if we preach that gospel at that level, we're actually preaching a gospel that says, come to Jesus because he's done this for you and you can have it. You can like go shopping and say, oh, there's Jesus on the shelf. Jesus has done that, but I'll take Jesus off the shelf or I'll put my card in and my pin and I'll get cash out and I'll get what Jesus wants. I'm doing a transaction with God because he's done that and I can buy into this and, I can, and I'm, I'm going to get salvation. And... Uh, it's like you see it, if you preach it just at that level, you end up with it centred around you and you getting what you want from God. And it's almost like saying, well, I'll give it a try and I'll see if God's going to come through on his promises of, of improving my life. He says, oh, your sins will be forgiven. And it can be easy to imply to that that your life's going to get better and things are going to be good from there on. And I'll give God a test. And when God doesn't quite come through in the way you expect it, it's easy then to walk away. Or to say, well, I've tried it, it didn't work. But that isn't exactly, that's only a part, if you like, a subset of the gospel that Paul is preaching. Because in all of those references I've given you from Romans, from Timothy, from Acts, they all say, it is Jesus who is Lord. It is Jesus who is the King. It is Jesus who has done these things. It is Jesus who has triumphed over death. It's about what he's done. You are coming to a God who is the King of all the earth, of heaven and on earth. And he is asking you to come to him. He has already come to us, and now he's asking you to respond and come to him. Does that make sense? And he is looking for a demand and a response that says, do you recognise who you are coming to. And actually, he is saying, God has got one offer to pull you up to his kingdom. He wants to raise you to where he is. Because he has already come down to earth and he says, it's not that good here, there's an awful lot going on. <laughs> he's now seated at the right hand of the Father. And he's trying to lift you to those higher places in your spirit. And I remember actually this is a conversation I had with Tim about another, con uh, another uh, situation and it's actually to do with marriage where a non-Christian marries a Christian um, in the hope that they can convert them. And he said, well actually, you know, it doesn't very often work because what happens is you as a Christian are in the high place, if you like, stood on the table and they're in, in the valley and you're trying to reach down and pull someone up to where you are. And it's much easier to pull someone down than it is to pull someone up. Now, let's just say it's impossible, but it's a tough, tough call, isn't it? That person's got to cooperate if they want to come up. 
And it's like that in this situation, you know, in the sense I felt, it's like that with Jesus. Jesus is in the high place, and he's looking to pull us up to where he is. Because doesn't it say in, the, in, the, in Psalms that he lifted us from the miry clay, from the pit? He wants to lift us up from where we are to where he is. Not us drag him, we're never going to drag Jesus fed, of course. But he wants to lift us up. And that means pulling us up out of the things that hold us down. And that is what will change our lives. And it's coming to Jesus on his terms, recognising that he is the Lord. He is the Alpha and the Omega. And that actually, we're not saying you come into my life, but actually I will bring my life into yours. And Paul makes that very clear right at the beginning. In various places we're going to look at this in Romans. His very first sentence is, Paul, a bond slave to Jesus Christ. In fact, I've got a slide for that there. Uh, let me see. It says, Paul, a servant, and that word servant is a bond slave. He is committed to doing what God wants him to do not fitting what he wants to do in with God's plan. He calls for a response and to live the way that God wants him. See, the gospel says Jesus is first and foremost. Yeah? Do we agree? Yeah. yeah. Well, if Jesus is first and foremost, there can only one thing that's first and foremost, and that's Jesus. If Jesus is first and foremost, it can't be me or you. We fit in with Jesus, not Jesus fits in with us. And he's made promises that when we come to him, what will happen, but we need to understand that we are coming to him. And when we say that, we sing songs don't we? like, I will trust in you alone. And I know I've got one person in the room that's particularly in this situation now, but I've been in it myself, of being made redundant. But I'll bet singing that chorus, I will trust in you alone, takes on a different context when you're actually in that situation. Or when you've got a health issue, or when something else isn't going right, and saying, Actually, Lord, I will trust in you alone. Jesus demands my soul, my life, my all, the old hymn writer said. <coughs> and it's when you see Jesus for all that he is, that's the Jesus where people are prepared to literally lay down their lives for him. Do you know why? Queen Mary is called Bloody Mary because she martyred, she killed many ministers who refused to resort to Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, literally hundreds, but they would not deny their faith in Jesus Christ. Literally hundreds of ministers killed for their faith and people through the ages have laid down their life for Jesus because they saw him who he was. It's the sort of faith that give, makes people give up good jobs and go off to other ministries. It's the sort of faith that makes people give out of their earnings to the ministry because they see Jesus and his strength for all that he is, not just as somebody who is a, uh, will provide their needs as and when if they like. you read the testimonies of many of the great people who've got great witnesses, John G. Lake had an amazing healing ministry, head of a newspaper, head of a multi-million equivalent organisation, who just gave it all up to go into ministry and others that followed that. And Jesus calls us to that same life of giving it to him first and making him first and foremost. And Paul makes that very clear when he says, I am a servant to Christ. Because we all have a calling on our lives. It may not be a, a, a ministry that will make the, the <laughs> history, but we all have a calling. It may not to be an apostle, but Christ has a role and a purpose and a plan for each one of us if we are prepared to commit our ways to him. I left the name Paul out of the beginning of that verse and I just wondered how comfortable we would be if we put our own name 
in there. Can I say, Walter, a servant of Christ Jesus? Can you say your own name and put it in there and feel comfortable that, yeah, I am a bond slave to Jesus and his calling? We don't want consumer Christianity, which is what we get if we preach just that you know Jesus will forgive your sins and you can you can dodge the coffin. But actually you need to preach the gospel that says Jesus is Lord of all the earth, as we sang that verse song, didn't we? The mountains shake at his name, you know, oceans roar at his name, wind and waves obey him, demons flee. Sickness disappears at the name of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus, who in his majesty, in his glory, in his holiness, was the one who died on the cross for us. Let's see him in his majesty, his glory, and his holiness. I'm tempted how do you feel about this? That next week, if instead of me preaching a sermon, we get two or three to think through this week of what is your calling, what do you believe God's calling is on your life, and you come and share that with us next week. That's a good idea. <laughs> 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 I think it'd be good to hear what the call of God is and how people have worked out that calling. Some are older than others, some say, this is how God has worked out his calling on my life. And perhaps each one of us could sit and think and just write down what, what, they believe, what you believe the call of God is on your life and how you're working that out. Because God, you know, God has got a calling to you. It may not be as dramatic or as frightening that's the one Paul had. But the calling can be, yeah, I know it's twee to use it, but as simple as making a coffee in church, being a servant heart. You know, through to standing at the front preaching these work sermons or leading worship. Everything. That, that kind of sounds like one's more important than the other, and it shouldn't really. But, you know, all callings have a different character and a different nature, and different colour, but they are centred around what God has called you with your gifting to do. So everybody, think about that, and I'll, I'll bring two or three in the week and say, are oh, you prepared to share what God's put on you, for you and your calling? Yeah? And we'll do that next week. Good. I'm glad you're all up for that. <laughs> <laughs> but let's take this word seriously. Yeah? There was something else I wanted to say, but I'm going to leave that for another time uh, as we move in. But let's, let's just pray for a minute. Let's pray. Because Father, you know, I, this, this, is, this is the heart of the gospel. And the, the other side of it is, I know, that it's, it's, it's easy to sound uh, almost like a cult or something that we're calling, calling people to. And, and that's not the case. We're calling people into a relationship with you. Uh, but a relationship that actually demands a response. Not one that is just uh, switched on and off when we want or when we fancy There are things we have to work through. Uh, we talked about two marriages in the church, or those couples are going to work through things, uh, they, but they can't just switch the marriage on and off. You, we work through it, and in our relationship with you, we, we work through it and say, what is the demand on me in this relationship? How do I repay you for all you've done? Father, how do I seek your kingdom first? <coughs> Father, how do I know that when I ask it will be given? When I seek, thank you that you promise I will find. Thank you, Lord, that you, 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 you care for us and you work with us and you're patient with us. But Father, we, we, we want to take up our cross and follow you. And Father, I thank you for all these people here that have, have been patiently listened this morning. And I pray that this word would go to their heart 
and we would plant a seed, Lord, not a seed that would be plucked away, which I think is when we preach weak gospel, it, it can get plucked away easily, but one that actually uh, makes a, a, a real difference and raises people up so that we see the healings, we see the move of the Holy Spirit, we see light where there is darkness. Yeah. May your name be uh, praised forever.